Welcome everyone. Welcome to the CG seminar today, uh, February 22nd. Uh, I'm Vincent Carpentier from UCL and CG, and it's my pleasure today to uh, to chair the, uh, this seminar, which uh, will uh, actually focus on the launch of a book from uh, Celia Will Church, William Locke, and Julio Marini, called Challenging Approaches uh, to uh, Academic Career Making. Um, before I, uh, I introduce the, uh, the participant, um, let's talk about the structure. First, uh, Simon Marginson is going to uh, introduce the book and will be followed by Celia Whitchurch, who is going to uh, offer the presentation of the, of the book and, uh, and its content. And then uh, we will end up with a discussion with uh, all of you. Um, <coughs> please note that uh, the Zoom seminar is being to uh, is being recorded and it will be av available later on YouTube. Okay, so a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, uh, please keep muted unless you ask to, sp uh, to speak. Uh, then uh, to join the discussion, use the chat. Um, we uh, recommend that you come early in the chat uh, as you know, you'll be selected and we'll call uh, uh, then uh, and ask to turn your camera on. So ask your question for the chat, use the speaker view as well, uh, please, because it will uh, allow you to see the speaker on, um, on camera at the same time. Okay, so uh, first of all, the, there will be an introduction by Simon Marginson, who is Professor of Higher Education at the University of Oxford and the Director of CG, and leader of Project 8 would be good on higher education. He is the editor of higher education and also the editor of the Bloomsbury uh, higher education uh, research. Uh, and this book is part of this series. Celia Whitchurch is an honorary associate professor at the USEL Institute of Education. Uh, she's, she was part of CG as part of this project from which the book drew upon, drew upon. And she has published widely on higher education workforce, including uh, you know, developing the concept of a third space professional, which is used by a lot of colleagues. So um, over to you, Simon, and I will come back to you after the presentation or discussion. Thanks, Bonson. I'm only going to speak briefly. This is primarily Celia's um, webinar, and she will present the contents of the book. But um, let me give some background. Uh, the um, uh, In 2014, 2015, uh, the Economic and Social Research Council uh, under UKRI, as it now is, the UK's um, research arm, uh, commissioned um, a new research centre focused on the future of higher education. And that was, and that, and the grant which established CG, as we called it, Centre for Global Higher Education, was uh, partly funded by the then Higher Education Funding Council of England, HEFCI. Um, 50% uh, from HEFCI, 50% from ESRC, and we established a centre. And one of the founding projects of the new CG, in, which began in November 2015, was the Future of the Academic Workforce um, project, which Celia and William Locke uh, um, led, and, um, uh, and that conducted its research, its actual data gathering and analysis over the next five years. And we're now seeing the the fruit, fruits of that project in the book, which Celia is going to present today. Let me give you some, some I suppose, longer term background for the record, because what we say in these webinars goes on YouTube and becomes, I think, a useful educational device. So I'm going to use the opportunity to say some things about the context of academic labour in England uh, and UK. The university as an institution and primar primarily when we talk about higher education, we're talking about universities, although they're not always called universities, they mostly are universities in a statutory sense. The university as an institution has multiple roles and purposes. And um, Clark Kerr famously called it the multiversity. But at the heart of, of higher education in all forms, including the contemporary university, are the intrinsic functions of student learning, teaching and student learning um, in knowledge, through immersion in knowledge, and linked up to that in academic labour, the focus of 
academic work on research inquiry and critical scholarship. And that loosely called the teaching research nexus is the heart of academic labor. And that is the heart of the contemporary institution. However beleaguered and problematized that heartland is, it continues to be fundamental to the university as an institution. And that you might call the intrinsic core of higher education, teaching and learning, knowledge, research, all mediated by academic labor. Uh, that intrinsic core has got joined to an enormous range of extrinsic functions. Uh, obviously, vocational preparation, professional preparation, occupational preparation in a very wide range of jobs, but also the role of higher education in building cities and regions, in serving communities in all kinds of ways, research and its impact, social and economic impact, and the impact of the work of higher education on global relations, cross-border relations as well. All of that, you might say, is extrinsic, and that all rests ultimately on academic labour. It all depends on the core functions of teaching and learning, immersion in knowledge and research, and they are conducted by academics. Okay, let's let's go backwards a bit to look at the beginning of the contemporary period, which I think the turning point, Bonson, as a political economist, you probably agree. 1975, the change, the turn away from Keynesian demand management at national level and the beginnings of monetarism and then, then what we call the new right at the time, which became neoliberalism. Um, and with their focus on um, reforming the public sector, inverted commas, reforming the public sector to make it more uh, business friendly, make it more like a market, make it more um, more productive in terms of the um, of the market economy and so on. So, um, great change in 1975, but also the other change which occurred in the universities all over the world and and in UK was massification growth so that in 1975 18% of young people were going on to higher education in the UK that if you include the whole of tertiary education that figure is now in the UK 77% and over a lifetime perhaps almost half of all the population will enter a university as students at some point so enormous growth has occurred and at the same time, we've seen the development of neoliberal and new public management techniques where the university is modelled like a business and where the job of managers, what we used to call academic leaders, we now call academic managers, um, their job is to extract as much value as they can from diminishing resources at any given time. Because with growth, the the um, resources per student has, has, has seen a fall and with neoliberalism in government, the the inclination of government is to reduce its direct outlays, its public spending, as much as possible. Um, and with the situation where students have to finance the system, as it has been the case in the UK for the last decade, um, there obviously are constraints on you, the ability of the system to raise the tuition fee, which is the unit of resource and which determines the amount of resources we have for higher education. So... We have the rise of the precariat, the um, number of proportion of, of teaching, which is now carried out by people who don't have, I suppose, stable full-time jobs, now well over 50% in the UK. It's the same in some other countries, but in other countries, it's not the same. Uh, academic labour is, is, is more, if you like, um, more full-time, more stable in some other countries than it is in the UK. So you, massification, falling unit of resource, the precariat, all of this eating into that, that core function of academic labour, that intrinsic core of higher education. And everything still depends on that. What remains of that intrinsic core still keep keeping on going. So that's a, a pessimistic picture, if you like. That's the context in which the research that Celia is going to report has been conducted. But I suppose there's another side to it, and that's that there is a, a continuing supply of people who, despite these conditions of work and the low expectation of a stable full-time job-based career, want to work in teaching and research in universities. 
And that's because this is very fulfilling and important work, very satisfying. If you've got enough time to, to, to blink to do the job, very satisfying work. Working with students is very good. Working with colleagues can be very good. And, and the opportunity to be creative, to express yourself, to commit to social responsibility, to carry out useful functions is very attractive. And the UK has outstandingly good academic cultures, in my view. As a non-British born person, I've only been in the country 10 years, and so and I have seen a lot of systems around the world. The academic culture in the UK is, is, is despite everything that's happened, to make it harder to be an academic, the academic culture is very strong intellectually and and you know there's there's a enormous number of people as i said who are, have been prepared to put up with these difficult conditions so that's the positive side so you've got all of the conditions that make it a difficult job and there's all those positive things about the job which makes it worthwhile and those two things like coming into collision all the time and in in in, in all of that there's just enough people who have this kind of commitment and, and joy from academic work to keep the whole thing going despite the difficulties. So, but how does it happen? What does this do to their career structures? What kind of life expectations do people now have in universities about working in universities? I think it's over to Celia now to tell us what she found in the research on those, on those questions. Celia. Celia, the floor is yours. Oh, yes, I'm just trying to load my slides. Thank you. Hang in there, folks. Here we are. Sorry about that. Well done. Okay. Well, thanks to Simon, first of all. Um, you were my first protocol for thanks uh, for, in particular, for steering the book through Bloomsbury Publishing, which was no easy matter. Um, I also want to thank Claire Callender, who has led the uh, CG group at the Institute of Education, who's been very supportive and encouraging. And of course, my co-authors, uh, William Locke, um, who wrote chapters two and six, and uh, Julia Marini, who did most of our interviewing for us and some of some statistical analysis. Uh, and finally, as uh, Simon has mentioned, uh, we, we acknowledge uh, the support of ESRC and Research England for Research Project 3.2. Uh, to, about which uh, Sam has given uh, such an excellent um, preliminary talk. Um, it's a very helpful background, thank you. So what's, what we found, what William and I found from previous work that we've both done was that uh, large scale data sets of which there are many nationally and internationally and even at institutional level, just weren't giving us the picture that we needed um, to understand um, how academic careers were going for individuals and what we thought was needed was a much more fine-brained account. Um, and this, this used to come up again and again uh, when we were talking to people um, who said things like, well, uh, the university templates uh, for career development, for promotion, um, the idea of a linear step ladder that we can, we can progress along um, isn't entirely convincing. Um, people aspired to that, but they weren't. They didn't always quite believe that um, uh, this career ladder was going to work for them. So what we wanted to look into was people's individual experiences, uh, and this was also the case um, at national level in the UK. We have the Higher Education Statistics Agency, and they produce annual. Um, and your figures of numbers of staff, movements, uh, disciplines, um, part-time, full-time, 
male, female, all that, that kind of data, um, which represents broad trends, but it doesn't show the way that people are interpreting the roles that they're given in their job descriptions as individual institutions. And uh, my particular issue with the HESA data is it has this very crude division between academic and non-academic staff. Um, and this isn't entirely, um, I mean, maybe true in one sense, but factually there are some, we encountered people, for example, who were um, undertaking academic work on professional contracts and vice versa. So there's a really sort of muddy area in the middle between academic and professional staff um, that isn't represented, particularly in HESA data. When we went to the literature, we found that um, the, these ideas about boundaried and boundaryless uh, careers, particularly Dowd and Kaplan, were the people who first talked about that. Now, boundary careers, sometimes called positional careers, the idea that you have a, a step ladder um, to the top of a career and that you progress according to certain criteria and according to certain timelines. And the other idea is that people um, undertake um, things that interest them, develop their careers sideways, as it were, and don't necessarily follow a positional career path. I mean, those are two extremes, obviously, and many people are doing a bit of both. So uh, what we felt was that neither the literature nor the statistics accounted for um, sort of general breakdown in positional careers. Now, the term breakdown may be a bit strong, but there's certainly a kind of mutation going on, as Simon has, <clears throat> has hinted. And what we wanted to find out was how individuals address uh, the challenges that they uh, face and, and in particular setbacks um, that they encounter. Um, and, and quite often, uh, on talking to people, we found that... Um, some uh, people are often very influenced by um, their own, hint, what I call hinterland, their own interests, predilections, work-life considerations, and that these are um, often not accounted for, uh, even when people have their annual review, performance review, and so on. People tend just to talk about the formal things. So just to give you a bit of background, uh, as Simon said, we conducted the project in in uh, between 2017 and 2020, and we actually did two sets of interviews, two years between them, uh, pre-COVID, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, there were eight institutions, and they were chosen according to a uh, geographical region in the UK, that type and disciplinary profiles. So the five in England, one in Scotland, one, one in Wales, and one in Northern Ireland, three Russell Group, two pre-1992 universities, two post-1992 and one post-2004, more recent universities. So, and in each institution, we went through gatekeepers. So although we were specific about the type of um, individuals we wanted to interview, um, we couldn't um, control for, say, gender. And in fact, we had far more women than men, as it turned out. Anyway, we asked for a director of HR, a pro-vice-chancellor, um, with interest in learning development, and six people who are undertaking academic work, um, three teaching research, one teaching only, one research only, one learning support. And we actually got that in the eight institutions. Some of them offered more than eight people. So we ended up with a total of 69. And the majority were in mid-career on open-ended contracts. Um, six were fixed term. Um, four research fellows, uh, two lecturers, and the average age is 45. So it's rather different from the studies that have been undertaken on early career staff. So we felt that was um, that was a, origi an original element of our work. When, when it came down to looking at careers, we based um, this particular analysis on 49, 49 people not having senior management team roles because we thought that was uh, they're more likely to be um, in mid-career and also um, more likely to be on the way up, as it were. And there were 44 academics, five learning support people, um, some of whom were, were on academic contracts and some weren't. Uh, three of the respondents were part-time uh, and it was uh, very biased towards social sciences. We hadn't really controlled for that. Um, so 20 social sciences, 12 science, technology, engineering and maths, 12 humanities, 
And as I said, bias towards a female, 65%, 35% male. I haven't actually checked how this compares with national statistics, but um, anyway, that, that's what we, we got. Interestingly, um, 20 of the 49 people had worked outside higher education, and this was evenly spread across institutional type. And we were able to do repeat interviews after two years with 39 of the academic staff. Um, obviously, that depended on them agreeing and being available. Some people have moved on and we were able to pick up their career development. And the retention rate in the second round was 80 percent. Um, 15 had been promoted, which was encouraging. Four had left the system, uh, two had retired, one had made, made redundant, one had gone to the private sector and two fixed term people have become permanent. So it wasn't an altogether um, depressing <laughs> scene. Um, and just to, because I, we're always asked this, <laughs> what were the um, employment categories? As, as this shows, uh, very large people doing teaching and research. Um, some of the people were middle managers, uh, heads of school or department, rather than being on the senior management team, we'd excluded those sorts of people. Um, some research only staff and some learning support professionals. So we thought it was a um, pretty good spread. And we were quite pleased to get 39 of the 49 to speak to us again. So the first um, cut, if you like, the analysis um, was to try to um, define uh, an approach to the career, their careers that each person was taking. And we divided these into three. The first one was mainstream. Um, so these were individuals that were very focused on, on the career structure. They placed in, emphasis on um, getting to the next stage, meeting the criteria and the timelines, and perhaps more importantly, focusing particularly on activities that they thought would be most valuable for the purposes of promotion. Um, and the interesting point about this is only 28% of people that we interviewed, we put into this category, which was a minority, which might be contrary to what you would think. However, 79% of those people were in the pre-1992 universities. Um, and as I said, the, the figure of 28% kind of um, justifies the approach we were taking because we thought there were other things at play apart from people's uh, desire to, um, you know, necessarily to get up the career ladder at all costs. So obviously that was a an important consideration. The second category um, we call portfolio um, because these were people who were um, gathering um, experience, academic experience, but also experience externally. I mean, perhaps in commercial world, perhaps in uh, uh, voluntary system, health, all those areas. Um, and they had a more open approach. So these sort of people that felt they could, they had got another string to their bone. They could possibly move to something else. And again, 68% of these were in the pre-1992 universities, which is quite interesting. And the third category called niche, who is um, not sort of substantial minority, I would say, of people who um, were felt it was important to prioritise their sort of personal interests and strengths um, and predilections. And they kind of moulded their activities within the university um, to find a, um, a place that was sort of comfortable and rewarding. Uh, and in some, in some cases could be used for career credit as well. Um, and 56% of those are in the post-1992 and post-1994 universities. Um, anyway, I, I, I won't want to read too much into all these uh, figures, but it was sort of an interesting first cut. However, we were very conscious that this was a, a very static kind of categorization uh, and only the portfolio category really begins to capture the fluidity of a career. Uh, and what was even more important was we thought that different approaches were likely to uh, dominate at different times of people's career and that they were likely to adjust their approach according to circumstances, not least, I mean, the obvious one, was family circumstances and quite often we were speaking to somebody who was part of a dual career couple. So um, this is sort of contrary to institutional career structures which tend to, well they're linear and they assume a unitary direction of travel and everybody's going at the sp same speed at the same time, uh, which isn't necessarily true. 
Um, and individuals, what we found was individuals were sometimes holding on to more than one uh, interest or activity or approach, uh, either at the same time or over a period of time, because they wanted to uh, um, leave options open. So in practice, um, we theorized by saying this, saying that individuals interpret uh, institutional progression cr criteria and policies uh, in a kind of dialogue with themselves and, and the social structures or the institutional structures they find themselves in. Uh, and if you look at Margaret Archer's work, she talks, she calls this the morphogenetic process. And as a result of this, we thought there could be sort of spatial aspects um, uh, to type of activity people undertook um, in terms of whether it was where it was inside the university, whether it's outside the university, whether um, you know, it was sort of on the boundary, but also temporal dimensions to enacting a career in, in, in the sense that people might focus on different things at different times and make adjustments accordingly. So it, we felt this was a more sort of flexible approach to looking at uh, careers. And we, in order to describe this, we came up um, with the idea of institutional script of, of career scripts. Now, this was an idea that had been floated by um, Daniel Louval in the early 2000s, who talked about uh, promotion scripts, but they, so it was rather limited to promotion. So we kind of adapted that um, to show how approaches can vary both over time and according to circumstances. So institutional scripts driven by formal career structures um, written down um, by the HR department in the university, um, including uh, promotion criteria, performance review, uh, timetables, work allocation models, um, mainly visible and quantifiable measures. Um, we then define practice scripts as being driven by activity associated with um, professional practice. Um, and in fact, we, we interviewed an, a lot of people who are involved in um, various activities outside the university. And these included uh, health, social care spectrum, um, journalism and the media, policing and probation. And the surprising number of people were involved not only in humanitarian work abroad, but also um, voluntary work at home, locally in their own town. Uh, and with NGOs. So there's quite a variety of things going on. But then there's quite a strong um, voice from people talking about what we called internal scripts. And these were driven by their personal interests, um, what, personal strengths and interests, uh, and the commitments they had, particularly to family and friends. Um, and the importance of work-life balance, which I think is an always taken account of, um, and it was all um, articulated um, within the university only through uh, informal uh, channels, for instance, with their, um, their mentors or occasionally through personal development plans when they had their annual performance review. But this was almost under the counter kind of motivations, uh, but they were quite strong. So just to talk a bit more about the way we theorize this. Um, for institutional scripts, we um, the, the, in which individuals focus their efforts on um, what they need to do in order to get on in their careers and get to the next stage. Um, we theorize this um, in terms of Archer's ideas about morphostasis, um, enacting a prescribed role and not looking beyond that, making pragmatic dis uh, decisions about balance and focus of activity, and prioritizing activities most likely to benefit um, in a linear career development. And an example of this was um, a female science lecturer in the pre-1992 Russell Group University who said, I've just been given a lot more administrative responsibility. So I tried to ask to drop some of those roles to take more time to do the research. But instead they said, oh no, you need to do that too do those roles even better to demonstrate your eligibility for promotion. So I'm going to be more selective about what I take on. So that was somebody obviously making a calculation um, about what would be um, most effective and productive um, for them to focus on without um, 
working themselves <laughs> to death, as it were. Um, so we found that quite interesting. Now, with practice scripts, um, this was very much individuals trying to maintain their professional cap capital reputation outside the university. Uh, but they're also using these kinds of credentials and contracts to enhance uh, what they're doing inside the university as well. And also, um, some people mentioned, you know, this might give them a way out if they needed it. So we saw these people as moving towards Archer's morphogenesis end of the spectrum, um, which the individuals empowered as an actor um, to um, direct uh, the course of their career um, personally. Uh, and it was typified by um, a male lecturer in applied science who said, my role is to bring lots of different pieces of data into one place and to look at policy relevant landscape designs. For, he was in a plant-based industry or working with a plant-based industry uh, so as to maximize conservation and environmental issues. This was a country in the third world that he was working in. And then he went on to say, I think a lot of applied scientists see themselves as academics who crossed the boundary into practice. I see myself as an academic, but only sort of 50% academic. And we thought, I particularly thought this was very telling uh, because a lot of people were saying this sort of thing without actually putting a percentage on it. But um, being a scientist, I guess that's, he was uh, keen to do that. And moving on to personal scripts. Um, I mean, there are not an inconsiderable number of people who, wanted to sort of contextualize their career within their own personal sense of identity, um, including the strengths, interests, relationships, and aspirations. And this, they sort of fully embodied the idea of Archer's morphogenesis, um, empowering themselves as actors um, within their career development. And in doing this, they were often trying to not only um, work on their strengths and, and use their strengths to not only to achieve satisfaction in what they were doing, but also um, they were keen to maintain work-life balance, outside commitments, which often fed into um, their work and also lifestyle choices. And I've already mentioned dual career couples and people with families, and that was often the case with them. And again, um, somebody, um, this was typified by a male uh, respondent in social sciences in post-2004 university. Um, I'm doing something that I don't dislike. I've got kids. I need to be home. It's convenient. I can be a big fish in a small pond. The money is good for what I have to do. I don't have any management responsibilities. People know me here. They know what I do, my strengths and weaknesses. So this was a person uh, finding a comfortable niche. Um, if you like, but I mean that was that's an element in in careers um, as well as getting to the next stage. So these are two kind of ends of the spectrum, and obviously some people are not in one category or another all the time um, in every situation. But it was quite interesting to tease out these strands um, among the dialogues. So. Um, as I said, uh, scripts may vary over time, don't necessarily represent fixed categories um, to which individuals can be assigned, which is why we moved away from the original kind of static categorization. Um, and although an individual may have a dominant script at one time, this may change as the circumstances change. And therefore, scripts over, over a period of time can reflect a, a kind of spectrum of positionings. And it was quite interesting that of the 39 people we interviewed twice, um, the dominant scripts had in fact shifted towards institutional scripts from 15 to 22 individuals and to internal scripts, um, a little less so, and away from practice scripts, quite dramatically so. And it was not terribly easy to account for this, but it, um, some of them have been promoted. So that, that could, um, or, or were focusing um, on getting promoted, about a third of them. So that might, might account uh, for sort of moving away from, um, from practice scripts. There was, there's also the uh, research excellent framework um, input going on 
the second during the second round of interviews, and I think people were probably focusing on that, or they'd settled into a bespoke role and weren't really looking to move elsewhere. But as I say, I couldn't we couldn't entirely explain these shifts, and we'll perhaps have to do a longer a longitudinal study to to do that. But anyway, it was an attempt to to see these movements and. Um, one can't be too precise about it, but there was definite movements between the scripts. But what was also um, what also came out and was what was interesting um, was what we called the way people dealt with misalignments and disjunctures uh, that they encountered. And these came out over and over again, not only in this project but in the previous projects that William and I had done. And the very familiar one, workload models, which I'm sure is familiar to all of you. Um, the fact that people felt they were doing innovative work, but it wasn't being fully recognised, particularly in relation to online and digital learning, for example, or learning support, um, and also pastoral care of students, that came up again and again as being very time-consuming and, and not not uh, not gaining much credit. And although um, the standard uh, contracts and job uh, profiles um, are roughly speaking for a teaching and research post roughly 40% teaching, 40% research, and 20% administration or knowledge exchange. Um, this doesn't necessarily reflect reality. And, and interestingly enough, a number of people didn't even know what their um, proportion, what proportion of each they were supposed to be doing. And even people in the same department gave us different answers. So that was quite interesting. Um, the other thing we came across was inappropriate promotion criteria. Um, I mean, above all, the belief that promotion on the teaching track is more difficult. I mean, that's been mentioned in the literature um, quite often, uh, increasingly often. Um, but another one came up was that non-social scientists said that they uh, found it very difficult to do the pedagogic research they needed to do to be promoted on the teaching track uh, because you know, they were scientists, they were used to doing science research and they didn't feel they could move over into social science. Um, in fact, several people said that. I mean, if it had just been one person, I'd have thought they were perhaps not trying hard enough, but several people said that. Uh, and we also came across several people saying they'd had restructuring and they were in the wrong department, essentially in the wrong department, um, which affected... Um, the, uh, the colleagueship that they could draw on, uh, so that the partners they could develop, the sort of career advice they could get, and um, seemed to find that quite difficult. It was all to do, I think, with people's identity and uh, their disciplinary identity too, but that seemed to happen not infrequently. So as a result of uh, all these, <laughs> these movements and uh, trends, if you like, um, we developed the idea of Constantine the Career. And in fact, we published a, a paper on this in 2021, which is now contained in one of the chapters of the book. Um, and what we, what we were trying to describe by this idea was that there were career movements, um, these career movements, not only over time, but also spatially using the different career scripts so that it meant that people could kind of speed up or slow down their career progress. Um, as I say, um, particularly if they had family responsibilities or elder care responsibilities, or people had all sorts of things that they wanted to do outside, outside their role. Um, and because of these other considerations, people were often focusing on different things at different times. As one person said, you have to play a long game where you choose which bits of the puzzle you can concentrate on at any one time. That was um, somebody in creative arts, the post-1992 university. Um, other um, two, two women we interviewed, uh, one said they deliberately had their children early so they could focus on their career. Another one said they decided to postpone having children so they could focus on their career. So people are sort of managing all these different considerations at any one time. Um, so the other thing that um, seemed to be happening in, in terms of spatial um, extension was uh, people 
doing work in areas I mentioned, uh, pastoral support, but also um, areas such as employability of students, online learning, professional practice, public engagements. These are all taking up people's time and they weren't necessarily in their job descriptions. And some people were, were making calculation that they could make a case for promotion on, on a specific activity such as this, which would make them stand out from other people. So there are all kinds of judgments being made. Uh, and also the extension of personal space, um, humanitarian and voluntary work I've mentioned. I, I, was, I was quite surprised at the amount uh, going on. Uh, people working in, for example, in shelters, doing um, uh, humanitarian work abroad, uh, helping people um, locally with, with language, all that kind of thing. Um, also, obviously, academics have professional networks, social media has um, extended these exponentially, but also family commitments were not an inconsiderable uh, consideration. So to conclude, um, we, um, <laughs> well, the project reinforced our belief that there's certainly a gap between um, formal pathways, institutional career pathways, and the way careers are practiced by individuals. Uh, and all, I mean, there has to be some structure that's, that's acknowledged, but I think more flexibility within the structure um, would be very helpful. I and mean, that, that's the message we got. Um, people are adopting fluid career patterns uh, with different career grits. Um, we also discovered um, a good deal of hidden activity um, outside of job descriptions for workload models, which, which I've mentioned, including student support. But also, uh, what I haven't mentioned, quite a number of people on, um, well, two people, I think it was, on teaching only um, contracts, but also in other projects we found this, were doing research and people on research only contracts were doing teaching. Um, and as I said, progression uh, was not necessarily in the trajectory and people didn't necessarily expect it to be so. And we, we had some interesting conversations with people who'd been turned down for promotion and understanding um, their response and how they uh, repackage themselves and reorient themselves was, was instructive. Uh, also a significant movement in and out of education, a third to a half of people had worked um, outside higher education and come in, mainly people on the teaching side, it has to be said. Um, and yeah, promotions policies, of course, um, every HR department has them, uh, but they're very likely to be generic. And uh, as many individuals said, unless they're inter interpreted constructively by line managers, um, they're, not, they're not very helpful um, in the last analysis uh, in getting recognition for, um, for extended activity. And also uh, there was a feeling that um, individuals didn't really believe in the promotion processes because uh, particularly, as I said, on the teaching track, because they, they didn't feel um, there's this feeling that unless you're doing teaching and research, you're not really going to get a chair. I mean, I think this is changing, but this did come out quite strongly. But perhaps, you know, the big lesson of all this is the critical role that line managers and mentors have to um, play in, in presenting um, the activities of individuals in ways that uh, can not only fit institutional criteria, but can be interpreted positively uh, by institutional um, promotions committees, particularly. So I think I, I think I'm just about on time, Vincent. So I will uh, stop sharing. There we are. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Celia. That was really. Uh really fascinating and uh, you know you manage you know to do that right on time which is great uh, as well so you know many things to discuss and uh, uh, i propose we uh, we start with uh, Camille Candico Alson please over, you, over to you Camille thank you Vincent and thank you for the french pronunciation of my name um so Celia, thank you. Um, this sounds like a really exciting book. It was really interesting to kind of hear um, what you had to say. And I think it reflects a lot of what I've seen in academia. But I guess what I was kind of wondering was what proportion of the interviewees um, you know, that you spoke with, would you say sort of felt agency in 
these choices versus feeling like they wanted to be in academia and they had to kind of react to the system um, or sort of like the system was being done to them versus um, the degree to which they felt like these were they were kind of happy and, you know, the, the system is what it is and this is what I have to do to kind of work within it um, and that sense of agency. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Can you, can everybody hear me? How do I get yes. back to? Yes. How do I get back to? Okay. Uh, oh, it's a very good question, uh, Camille. Now, I mean, I have to say, I mean, there, there was a spectrum, but I didn't come across anybody who's perhaps one or two people who seemed to have um, managed to go up the ladder as they had hoped. Uh, but most people were having to uh, make adjustments, were thinking very hard about what they could do, how to be persuasive. Uh, the other important point perhaps I missed was the importance of creating a profile um, online as well as in person through professional associations um, with colleagues in the institution, networking, social capital, I guess. That, that is all seems much, much more important um, uh, and, and just accepted as part of life than, than it was, I mean, I'm retired, but certainly when I started at work, you know, this wasn't so much the case. I mean, it's gradually developed, but I mean, it's a really important. The young people were saying, you know, you have to have a good program. Think so. Questions are in the chat are growing, so yeah, they're going well. It's been like a lot of interest. Yeah, it's a good book, a good presentation. And uh, you know, this is tens of thousands of people are studied in this book, in effect, and so little is written and researched in relation to the academic, academic labor. This is important. And as you mentioned, I think a lot of people are going to be interested, uh, you know, in different countries as well to see how oh, yes. this. Um, yeah, um, it's about labor markets. Christine Musselin did a really interesting study where she compared Germany, France, and the UK, and found that there you are know, different entry processes, different regimes about tenure, different um, ratios between permanent and non-permanent staff. Doctoral doctoral period had different meanings in different countries. In some countries, it was a member of academic staff, and others, it was a student role. Um, so they're all different, but they all have in common these these general problems of massification, neoliberalism, new public management, performance pressure, um, but some systems filling those things more than others, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Vonson, I'm sorry, it won't let me unmute. We'll try again. Okay. Might have to come on with sign language. Uh, I'll see you there. Or you could write messages in the chat in response to the very interesting questions you're getting. Okay, so we have like... We've got many questions apart from the one which was, where the answer is incomplete. There's also Milton. Yeah. Rana. Yeah. Iran. Joanne. Yeah, there's a lot. So maybe Nilton can join us. Yes, of course. Good yeah. afternoon. So Hello, yeah. Thank you, Professor Celia. Um, it was a very interesting presentation. And my question is um if you selected the part-time individuals in your research, would you have a similar view or would it even reflect an even more erratic or precarious career progress for those individuals? Thank you. Yeah, Nathan, I must, uh, 
I must add that Celia is not on the chat, uh, you know, at, at, at the moment. So uh, um, maybe we hold your question and. Uh, um... Sure. sure. Here are. There's an answer coming through. We only had two to three part time. Okay. Uh, okay. Two free part time. Okay. So I guess from that it's difficult to to generalize, but uh, I guess it's really good. Uh, you know. Uh, question to uh, try to um, maybe to do some more research on that and to see what's the effect on uh, on part time work. I think Anton does a suggestion. Uh, maybe yes. you bring in the other questions. Yes. Get let them all go on record. Uh, okay. Won't, the the chat won't be remembered necessarily, but the okay. The video so I'm going I'm going to call uh, Rana Marinton, please. Rana, could you? Could you ask your question and then? Yeah. Um, so I think you, Celia mentioned that uh, some of the people interviewed had previous experience outside academia. And I wondered if she had a sense of how easy staff felt it is to move between roles within and beyond academia and also how that might affect career progression. I mean, anecdotally, people say it's harder to get back into academia once you leave on some occasions. But I know that within some of the government policy papers, they're promoting more porosity in terms of um, making transitions. OK, thank, thank you, Rana. So let's see if Celia can uh, answer through the chat. For us. You know, as Simon suggested, I'm going to ask uh, the next uh, the next question, which is from Yiran Ma. Hello, Yiran. Could you could you ask your question, please? Hello, uh, thank you very much, Professor Celia, for your very fascinating sharing. Um, researchers with fluid or precarious academic career pathways, they may feel isolated in collaboration with formal pathway researchers, um, which could create a um, hierarchical academic culture. So I wonder, how do you think about how could institutional scripts empower equal collaborations among different track researchers, recognize precarious job researchers' professional identity and provide them with abundant, horizontally diverse career in development opportunities with their relatively advantageous personal scripts um, of autonomous flexibility and freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Yiran. Okay, so we've got like an answer from, uh, from Celia. Um, uh, about the question about like moving out and there, which is uh, that most of those uh, uh, participants who had uh, worked elsewhere were in teaching, in further education or in schools. And she adds that uh, those with practice scripts were more confident. It's an interesting uh, you know, differences between the kind of uh, um, ways of looking at the scripts and the um, implication. So the last question from Iran was, uh, how could institutional scripts empower equal collaboration among different track researchers, uh, recognize precarious job researchers' professional identity, and provide them with abundant, horizontally diverse career development opportunities with their relatively advantageous personal script of autonomous flexibility and freedom? Yeah. 
ماتش هو قفل I think that due to this uh, technical incident, I think um, I think we should draw to a close. And uh, you know, it, these things happen. So you know, uh, sorry, Celia, and sorry for uh, you know to everyone for that. Uh, but you know, that was a very uh, it was very uh, you know an interesting uh, you know presentation, introduction, and uh, and discussion from the time we could. Uh, uh, um, developed it and uh, you know i hope it will make you uh, i've made you uh, you know wanting to to read the book uh, and um, you know to learn from it and uh, um, and uh, um, to try as, to contextualize to other kind of an environment as well so i would like to say uh, many thanks to everyone and uh, just to say that the next uh, seminar will be uh, next Tuesday, Tuesday 27th of, of uh, February. It will be on the challenges of curriculum decolonization within the post-colonial Indian context by Musumi Mukherjee. And we look forward to see you uh, uh, then next week. So thanks a lot, Sylvia, and uh, thanks a lot, Simon. And bye, everyone. See you next time.